Okay. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Those of you that are happy Sabbath, and for those of you that are joining us um, on Facebook and those on Zoom, I'm going to try to keep my uh, remarks, starting remarks, a little bit short today if I can, because I've been crowding in and running out of time. Um, one of the problems of being a long-winded preacher. So, <laughs> anyway, um, but let's, uh, I did, did want to make a reminder of those of you that uh, came to the church last um, Sabbath at 2 o'clock. We're going to do that again today. Hopefully we'll have the loudspeaker and I uh, look forward to uh, doing that again outside. That was a lot of fun, so uh, I hope that uh, even more of you will be able to come this week. Um, before we go ahead and right, right, let's uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads. Dear Lord, we're so very, very grateful that we can be here on this Sabbath day. Lord, as we get started with our message here today, we need your Holy Spirit. Or what's the point? So, we're asking that you will come and be here with us. Let us enjoy that uh, beautiful presence of Jesus. Give us. The, the ability now to be able to see him and to get another glimpse of his beauty and his glory. And we thank you for dying for us on the cross. I just praise you for each person uh, that's here today. Be with each member, those that even can't be here for whatever reason. We just ask and pray that you'll uh, be there to comfort them or whatever they need. Right now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. William Borden did his undergraduate studies at Yale University, and he became a missionary candidate planning to go to China. But when he made his decision to invest his life in this service, many of his friends said, you're crazy. I mean, you've got a good family. You have wealth. You have influence. Why are you going to throw your life away in some foreign country? And William, they said, why? Why? I mean, you could have such a worthwhile, enjoyable life right here. Don't do it, is what they said. But William Borden, he heard the call of God. And while he was in Egypt on his way to China, even before he had much of a chance to do anything, he became sick. Soon it became evident to everyone, including himself, that he was going to die. And at this point, Borden, he could have said to himself, what a waste. I mean, my friends were right. Why didn't I just stay there in New Haven? But Borden didn't think that way. And as he lay on his deathbed there in Egypt, he scribbled a farewell note to his friends. That was some, in some sense an epitaph. And the note said, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. Friends, when I, when I talk of my spiritual life, and when I think about it, you know, I wish that I could say, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. And you know, if we have lost anything for Jesus, wouldn't it be worth it? Isn't it worth it? Are we giving everything to our Lord every day? And if there was an attitude of commitment, it was the Apostle Paul. And Paul understood what it took to keep his fire for Christ alive. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, it's our scripture text today. If you have your Bible with you, uh, or your device there, please turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31. First Corinthians 15, verse 31. I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Paul, he understood to have the fire of the Holy Spirit exploding in, in our lives, it has to be a daily thing. And this is, this is strong language about this process. I die daily. 
This is a daily experience, not a, a once in a lifetime or a once in, in forever experience. And he goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, just uh, the next book over in 2, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Paul tells us the inward man is being renewed day by day. Now we need this renewal of the Holy Spirit every day of our life. And Paul goes so far as to command us to be filled by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, which interestingly is a continuous action verb, which in the Greek means we are to keep on being filled with the Spirit. You see, with the infilling of the Spirit, the believer is led by the Spirit. And Paul is just continually directing us back to this important fact that this is a daily experience when he states uh, in Romans 8.14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons. Of God. And again, here in this verse, this is, an, this is a verb uh, form in the Greek, and it's a continuous action. And Paul is actually saying here, as many as are continuing to be led, be led daily by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. We have to receive the Spirit every day to be led by Him every day. I remember, some of you remember Morris Vinden. And I remember him saying, when I was just a, a young man, our only legitimate effort that we can put forth in our sanctification process is to spend time with Jesus. Now, I heard Herb Larson years later take it even farther than that and he said, if you are not willing to spend at least an hour with Jesus every day, then don't even bother with the Christian walk. And that may be too strong, but personally, I don't think we can say this strong enough. Because if we are not willing to take the time, if we are not willing to claim the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the most important thing, that we can do first thing in the morning, then we need to reconsider if this Christian thing is something that we really want in our lives. Or are we infatuated with the idea of being filled by the Holy Spirit? You know, Jesus gave us an amazing example. We are blessed to have the example of Jesus. And Jesus, he daily received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in the early hours of the day, the, the Father would awaken him from his slumbers. You know, many times we see him spend all night in prayer, just, just wanting to spend time with the Father. And you know, we may need to ask ourselves the question, are we sold out to Jesus? And if we are, we will be claiming the promise that God will give us the Holy Spirit. You know, I love, love the testimony of a young preacher from Zimbabwe. He said this. He said, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present, present makes sense. My future is secure. I no longer need preeminence or prosperity, position, promotions, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regard, uh, regarded, or rewarded. I, do, I won't give up, shut up, let up until I have prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. 
And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner is clear. I like that. No backing up, no wavering. You see, we have a part, not in earning our salvation, no, but in being filled by the Holy Spirit. And friends, our part is simple. Now let's face it, there's not too many things in this life that are that are, are simple. But this is simple, not easy. Don't misunderstand me, not easy. Our part is absolute surrender, sold out, submitted, totally given, whatever you want to call it. You see, it's the easiest, hardest thing that we will ever do in this life. The easiest because we have the promise that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is the one that makes it happen. You see, with the trials, the Holy Spirit will also give us love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And friends, there is nothing that even comes close to the joy and the peace that we receive as we grow up in Jesus, when, when we're filled with this fruit of the Spirit. And you know, submiss submission is the hardest thing that we will ever do because we have to move self out of the way for it to happen. Now, the Holy Spirit will not jerk the steering wheel out of our hands or the remote or the cell phone. But what are the benefits of being baptized by the Holy Spirit? You know, we've talked about this before. What are the, the three main functions of the Holy Spirit? Do you remember? Well, number one is awakened love. Love for God. Love for each other. Love that you can't hide from people. They can't help but see it. And number two, the Holy Spirit gives power to our witness. Immediate effectiveness in soul winning. In fact, the only way that anyone ever accepts Jesus as their Savior, or even grows in their walk with Jesus, is, is being filled by the Holy Spirit. Now, we get used, but it's the Holy Spirit that makes it happen. You know, we're benefited because we see people come to Jesus and realizing that they will spend eternity with greater joy and greater peace and greater love. I mean, I mean, it's just plain more exciting and fun than we can ever imagine. It's, it's a benefit that makes our life worthwhile. It's the greatest adventure that we will ever go on in this, on this earth. And number three, the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of Jesus' character in our lives. Christ's likeness, can you imagine? Being like Jesus. I mean, this is what Paul is talking about in, in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Again, if you have your device or your Bible there with you, 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. And, and friends, God's glory is his character. Turn with me to Exodus 33. Down on the other end of the Bible, in Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19. Here we get a picture of God. He gives us a glimpse of uh, of who he is. Again, in, in Exodus 33, 18 and 19. It says, And he said, Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness. This is, of course, Moses asking God this. I, and God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, 
and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God is saying, my glory is my goodness. You see, it's his compassion, it's his character, it's who he is. You know, one of, the, one of my modern day heroes is Jim Elliott, and even more so his wife. Jim, along with some other missionaries, went to try and reach tribe a tribe of natives in Ecuador. And they decided before they even got there that they would not defend themselves, even if it cost them their lives. They were afraid that if they fought back and, and hurt even one of the natives that they were trying to reach, it might make it impossible for missionaries uh, to share Jesus with them later on. And so him and a few other men allowed themselves to be killed with loaded pistols in their possession because they wouldn't take the chance that these natives might shun Christianity if they used them to defend themselves. And even braver, Jim Elliott's wife later went into a small village or went into the same village and living, she was living there with the very people that killed her husband. And a large number gave their lives to Jesus. Jim Elliott wrote this shortly before he was killed. He said, Pray a strange prayer today, covenanted with the Father, that he would do either of two things. Either glorify himself to the utmost in me or slay me. But his grace, by his grace, I will not have second best. He was saying, Lord, fill me or kill me. You know, I found myself praying this over and over again as I fasted and prayed these last few weeks realizing that I can't do ministry. I can't be a man of God uh, without this completism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill me or kill me. You know, we get the privilege of glorifying God or glorifying the Father by being used and taking this character of Jesus. In my favorite book, The Desire of Ages, that beautiful commentary on the life of Christ. On page 173, I found this encouraging statement. It said, when the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of, of sadness and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. Friends, the only thing that can stop that from happening is us. We have to die daily. Lord, fill me or kill me. I mean, that's what I've been praying. I mean, do you have the courage to pray that with me? I remember when this concept fell on me. The Lord had been opening up this concept of the Holy Spirit to me. I had prepared my sermon, and Sabbath morning, God put this impression on me that the sermon that I had prepared was not the one that I was going to preach. And I hate that. I hate that when God does that. I mean, I've worked on this sermon all week, and now, now God changes everything. And, and of course, he, he does this. He's done this many times. Changed my sermon on Sabbath morning. This is nothing new. But this time, he wasn't telling me what he wanted me to preach, just not the one that I planned. Now, this is disturbing. This is it's a hard thing for a control freak, a planner. And it's getting closer and closer to time to preach. Still, no sermon, just the impression that God was going to do something different than what I what I had planned. Finally, I, I got up to preach and the Holy Spirit fell on me like I, I've never experienced before or after. 
And I preached for 35 minutes, and to this day, I remember none of it. A dear friend of mine said it was the best sermon that he had ever heard me preach, and he called it, Fill Me or Kill Me. <laughs> I, I use that expression, Fill Me, Lord, or Kill Me. Friends, when we get to the point where we can say, Lord, fill me or kill me and mean it, God will fill us with his Holy Spirit and put our lives, our hearts, and our lives on fire. And I, ass I assure you, church families, there, there are worse things in this life than death. Many of us know this. And living this life, Without the Holy Spirit is one of them. When James Colbert went out as a missionary to the cannibals of Fiji Island, the captain of the ship did everything in his power to change his mind from going. He said, you'll you, you lose your life. You, you'll lose the life of those that are, are going with you to those, those savages. And Colbert replied, we died before we came here. Now, there's really only two choices here, at, in, in, two choices that we have. Die to Jesus daily or grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed, for the day of redemption. If we do not daily seek the Holy Spirit and cooperate in following where He leads us, His power in our lives will wane and our Christian experience will weaken. And friends, another thing about God, He will not force us. But when we receive this baptism of the Spirit, we will have a great, it will have a great impact in our life. We'll feel his prompting as never before. He will be daily putting the desire in our hearts to obey God. The Spirit will, will cause us to begin loving righteousness and hating sin. I mean, that's what it says there in Psalms 97.10, right? You who love the Lord hate evil. But along with this freedom from sin is the freedom to disregard the Spirit's prompting. And when we do this, we begin the process of grieving or quenching, quenching the Holy Spirit. And Paul again gives us some very practical advice in several places in his writings of how to avoid this. And these practical counsels are aimed at helping us maintain this fullness of the Spirit in our lives. Let's look at one in, in 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm going to read right into this because of time. Um, but beginning in verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 14. Now we, now we exhort you, brethren... Warn those who are unruly. Comfort the, the faint-hearted. Uh, faint Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Love this part. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Then in verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Paul knew that the Spirit of God dwelling in our lives would be prompting us to do the things listed here. But if we refuse to yield to his promptings, we are in danger of grieving or putting out the Spirit's fire, quenching the Spirit. And friends, if you've been grieving the Spirit, don't get discouraged. Instead, ask God to forgive you. I mean, what does it tell us in 1 John 1, 9? We know this text. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. And he will. And he doesn't forget the rest of the text there. It's not just to forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit, it's not, he's not like us. He's not fickle. He doesn't have mood swings like we do. He isn't always thinking of himself. You know, too often we're like the young man who poured out his heart's devotion in a letter to the, the, the girl of his dream. He wrote, Darling, I would climb the highest mountain, swim the, the widest stream, cross the burning desert, and die at the stake for you. P.S. I will see you on Sunday if it doesn't rain. <laughs> you see, when we find that we've been quenching, quenching the Spirit, sl slipping away from Jesus, we, we can't let another minute go by without confessing our sin, accepting God's forgiveness and claiming this, this awesome promise that He will cleanse us from this unrighteousness drive, that, that drives away the Holy Spirit. Now, unfortunately, for most of us, it's just getting comfortable with half a life. Comfortable with a, a little bit of what God wants to give us. That Danish philosopher, Kierkegaard, was, has a parable of a wild duck that hits all too close to home for many of us. And with his mates, this duck was flying in the springtime northward toward Europe. And during the flight, he came down in a Danish barnyard where there were tame doves. So he enjoyed some of the corn. He stayed for an hour. Then he stayed for a day. Then a week. Then for a month. And finally, because he relished the good fare and the safety of the barnyard, he just stayed all summer. Well, one autumn day when the flock of wild ducks were going way southward again, they passed over that same barnyard, and their matey heard their cries. And he was stirred with a, a strange joy and a delight, and with a great flapping of wings, he rose in the air to join his comrades in the flight. But he found that his good fare had made him so soft and so heavy that he could no longer rise and he couldn't even get higher than the eaves of the barn. And so he dropped back down into the barnyard. And he said to himself, Oh, well, my life is safe and my food is good. And every spring and every autumn when he heard the wild ducks honking, his eyes would gleam for a moment and he would begin to, to flap his wings. But finally the day came when the wild ducks flew over and they uttered their cry. And he paid not as the slightest attention to them. Folks, when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, we are really talking about receiving the early rain. Now, how important is it that we receive the early rain? You know, one of the things that we talk about often as part of the Advent message is the latter rain, right? I mean, why is it so important for us to receive this latter rain? Well, it's the latter rain that prepares us for the trials and the difficult times just before Jesus returned. It's the latter rain that prepares us to, to reach the flood of people that will accept this message just before Jesus comes. You know, if we don't receive the latter rain, we'll not be ready when Jesus returns. I mean, all the, the signs tell us that it's time for the latter rain to fall. And I believe that Jesus' coming is right upon us. I mean, even if it's 10 years or 20 years or 100 years, which I don't think so. But if it is, won't we still be so much better off living in the Holy Spirit anyway? Well, of course we will. But if we don't experience that infilling of the Spirit, which is the early rain, we won't be prepared to receive and participate in the work of the latter rain. You know, I believe God is moving among His people today. 
And in this church, in our churches, he's leading as many as are willing into the, this wonderful experience. You see, as long as we are content with a theory of the truth, but we're lacking in this filling of God's Spirit working in our lives, transforming our character, we are cutting ourselves off from what we need to be effective witnesses for Jesus. I saw it put this way the other day. It said, the great sin of those who profess to be Christians is that they do not open the heart to receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, we must have this filling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, if we're not giving our whole life to Jesus, if we're not seeking after this filling of the Holy Spirit daily, if time with Jesus every day isn't the most important thing in our lives, if we've not received this baptism of the Holy Spirit, we must not put it off another day. We must not put it off another moment. You see, receiving the Holy Spirit, which is to be filled with Jesus, should be first and foremost in our lives because this gift of the Holy Spirit will bring every other gift with it. Elizabeth Barrett Browning's parents disapproved so strongly of her marriage to Robert Browning that they disowned her. Almost weekly, Elizabeth wrote love letters to her mother and father asking for reconciliation. They never once replied. And after 10 years of, uh, of letter writing, Elizabeth, she re received this, this huge box in the mail. And she opened it, and to her dismay and heartbreak, the box contained all of her letters to her parents. None of them ever opened. And today, those love letters are among the most beautiful and classic English literature. And I wonder, had her parents just, just opened and read only a few of them? I mean, they might have been reconciled to the daughter. And instead, they never were. You know, God has written love letters to us through his word. He wants to reconcile us through his Holy Spirit. Because remember, the Holy Spirit is our link to Jesus. Without the filling of the Holy Spirit, we will never be filled with Jesus. The infilling of the Holy Spirit will change our lethargy to excitement enthusiasm, our weakness to strength, and our witnessing will be imbued with a power not seen since the time of, of Pentecost. So friends, let's daily seek the Holy Spirit by opening God's love letter and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform our lives. Will you do that with me? Will you? Let's close with Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you that we have the hope, that we have the promise in Luke eleven thirteen, Lord, that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. This connection to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our God, we thank you for it already and we praise you and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a wonderful day. Again. Hello to my grandchildren. I love you dearly. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys later. Hopefully uh, those here in Juneau at 2 o'clock.